What's your daily schedule like now, basketball wise? Now, just pretty much uh, what, wake up. I'll either some days I'll go to the track or run some hills. Um, uh, I'll hang hang out with family for a little yeah. bit, and then yeah. probably like go to go outside, go shoot some hoops out at a park or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's trying to keep up with as much as he can. It's uh, it's tough for athletes this time, right? You know, yeah. you don't have the same access to gyms and coaches and stuff. It's yeah, no, nah, not at all. I know it's yeah. kind of tough right now. Listen, man, let's uh, let's get right into it now. Then, what's um, obviously here talk about the mental side of basketball. What was your first kind of clue that the mental side of basketball meant something to to reach the level you want to reach? How young were you when that kind of clicked? Um, pretty much my father's been talking to me about like the mental side of basketball ever since I was young. So yeah. pretty much what he taught me was um like mostly basketball is 80% mental and like 20% physical. So I'm like, for the most part, I've just been raised up under that and, and the stress and the importance of how, how, uh, how, how much of the mental side of basketball is need to be brought out. Um, so pretty that's that's all i've been been coached and preached under since i was a young since i was real young it's been part of your game since day one then eh yeah 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 tell me what it's like um because it's so often with a lot of the young kids that i coach and and consult with they're kind of around that 14 15 year old mark and they're starting to get Mm -hmm. scouts coming to them right scouts coming to their games and, and they start feeling that pressure when you were back then at that age how did you deal with sort of the pressure of, you know, knowing you're trying to get scouted um, to go play some college ball and, and kind of dealing with that? Um, it was it was always a little like a little pressure, always yeah. nervous of how you would play. But pretty much you just got to get into a, the mindset of being confident in who you are, knowing the importance of your game and what it is and what you can bring to the table. So just always having pretty much just having that that feel for the game and that confidence and swagger about yourself that you know what you can bring to the table. How, how would you describe your play as a basketball player? Um, my play, I would say that I'm a type of player that plays both sides of the, uh, of the ball. I play defense. I play, I can uh, score the ball. Um, I'm trying to check the best player on the floor <laughs> at any given moment. Um, just, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a, um, I can shoot the ball real well. Uh, I feel like getting to the lane uh, whenever. So, yeah, yeah I'm a, I feel like I play both sides of the ball. Really well. the, the playing both sides of the of the ball, I think, is so important for a lot of the young kids to understand because, you know, your shot's not going to be there every night. Some nights you're going to have an off yeah. night, but you can still contribute in other ways. Sometimes people will get yeah. hung up on the stats, the offensive stats, to see if somebody had a good game. But you can have yeah. just as much of an impact on the defensive side of the floor. You look at somebody, I mean, the most extreme case is someone like Dennis Rodman who can get zero points but 30 rebounds in a game and he yeah. goes on to win five or six championships, whatever it was. Yeah, most definitely. There's always ways you can impact the game other than scoring, always. Tell me a bit about the jump from high school to, to college ball playing at George Mason. Um, and just the differences you found in the game and how you had to adapt to it from that, that jump. Um, pretty much that jump, it was, it was much more of a, more of a, uh, it was a big jump because in high school, you know, it's more like fast breaks because yeah. of like bunch of turnovers or something, just pretty much a up, like real up tempo pace pretty much. But, uh, with like the, the way that the game was played at the college level was just, it's just more, um, uh, it'll be more off half court sets, more, um, uh, more half court uh, play. Mm-hmm. It'll be more. It's just more more structure at like if you will say there's more structure to it. Um, the defensive side is is highly emphasized at the college level. Yeah. You got to be able to play defense, or you're definitely you're coming out of your game. Um, <laughs> and it's just um, it's just a more more intent. Like it's just more intense than at the yeah. college level. I know your fir- your first year there, you kind of got thrown into the fire. You're one of the the key pieces to that team. Yeah. Did you have any expectations of that going in that it was going to come that quick? Um, no, I didn't. I actually just wanted to 
just prove to the coaches uh, uh how I could I could be one of those guys and coming out uh, and being a starter, being one of those key guys. I was just pretty much trying to prove myself more than anything. But I didn't come in like with that, uh, with like expecting to like start or, or just being one of the guys to like uh, contribute to the team, really. Yeah. Tell me a bit about um, how you prepare for a game, maybe specifically that your first start in college. Walk me through the emotions and your thought process leading up to it. Was it was the nerves getting to you there, or did you have enough mental training, like you said, from your experience and from your dad? Um, to kind of know how to deal with that situation, because that's got to be a special, yeah. a special memory. Your first college start. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's always going to be like uh, just the jitters, nervousness yeah. of the first game, but uh, pretty much I always reflect on back on, reflect back on how like uh, I was brought up and how I play the game, and just pretty much uh, just going in with the mindset of just playing my game and not trying to do more than what I I'm capable of doing. And um, just pretty much just being me and yeah. just locking in through, like, from the start to the finish of the game, even through warm-ups, I just go in, get my headphones on, listen to my uh, to whatever song I got playing, yeah. and just pretty much just don't, just tune into to the game and into the moment. I think that's so important for athletes that play any sport is being true to who you are, no matter what level you play at, because you'll see some kids, they'll yeah. jump from high school to college and then maybe college to pros they might yeah. change the way they play to, uh, you know, appease other people or fans or what yeah. they think people want to see of them, but they forget what brought them there. If, if it's the hustle and the defense that got you there, then stay true to that and just yeah. continue yeah. to build on your strengths. Yeah. Always, always. And just getting, just making sure you, um, make sure you just, just sharpen those skills that you already have. Just yeah. making sure you become the best, your shooter, the best shooter that you can possibly be possibly be your playmaker best po- playmaker you could possibly be just making sure you just sharpen those skills that you already have and whatever adds on it adds on to the on, as it comes is there any part of your game that that you're you're trying to work on specifically right now that might be like a weak point to you that that you've identified and are trying to to bring it up to that strength level mm-hmm. um right now i would say i'm definitely working on my ball handling making sure i sharpen up my ball handle um, I would I would say I wouldn't say it's like weak, but it's definitely something I would, I need to sharpen up for sure. Yeah. Um, just um my quickness as well. I've been working on that. Um, just making sure I I run these hills and and doing all that I really can and to like uh just get my quickness up, running the yeah. track, get being timing myself, things like that. Um, just trying to. Just get better. Pretty much my lower my legs. Just trying to strengthen in my legs is yeah. pretty much what I'm what I've been working on. Yeah, we uh, we touched a bit on your time at George Mason. I know your last season there, you had an injury and you sat out for most of the season. Mm-hmm. I think you only played about six or seven games that year. Yeah, yeah. Tell me yep. how how you dealt with that because it's never easy for an athlete to sit on the sidelines and watch their their buddies and their yeah. team throwing ball. Yes. It's always tough just sitting there watching. You just feel like you need to do something, like yeah. just want to get up and do do something. But it was it was tough um, just sitting there watching and watching my teammates. But I was definitely cheering them on, happy yeah. for them uh, throughout throughout the process. But um, it, it's tough. It's, it's tough dealing with an injury. And pretty much I was just telling myself, like, my time's going to come. Just make sure I take it day by day getting myself stronger, uh, getting back healthy, being able to get back out there. I just did all that I could to get myself back up, get back uh, into tip-top shape and make sure that I'm healthy to be able to come back out and play. Yeah, I always feel when athletes go through such adversity like that, it helps them grow as a person and as a player and it really teaches you those lessons. Yeah. And for big injuries, even for myself, when I had injuries, if I had long layoffs off of sport, it taught me how to be patient and how to trust the process. Not to be yeah. cliche like the Sixers or anything, but yeah. I was always always under the assumption when I get an injury, I want to rush back and get back as quick yeah. as possible. And that's that's probably the yeah. worst thing you can do ever. Yeah, it is. It definitely is. That's how I, I be. I try to rush, but I have to yeah. always remind myself that I have to take just take my time and make sure that I'm healthy and get back into it. Yeah, yeah. Walk me through your decision to to transfer to TCU because I know. I mean. It's never easy for somebody to leave a place they've played at for three or four years and go to a yeah. new school. 
Yep. Uh, so pretty much, um, I through the uh the transfer uh situation, I was uh I was looking at what I was looking at Arkansas, mm-hmm. uh, Illinois, Illinois. Um, I was looking at who else? Uh, just a couple other schools. I can't. I'm yeah. not. I can't remember right now. But um. Pretty much, I took a visit to um, to TCU, and I just felt like it was just the right situation for me, and um, I was going to be able to get the opportunity to come out and play, and um, which is pretty much what I wanted. I didn't want to be like uh, pretty much starting all over like how like mm-hmm. I would be like as a freshman, just but he it, they was presenting me with the opportunity to come and play, and I felt like it was the best move for me, and I just. I just went with it. I felt like the coaching staff was great. Um, the players were great. I mean, it was just an awesome situation for me. And I just moved on. Speaking about coaching staff, you had obviously the option there to opportunity there to play under Jamie Dixon, who's legendary pit coach, one coach of the year, yeah. Big East champion, everything. Talk to me a bit about what it was like playing under him and some of the maybe mental lessons you learned while that year with him. Uh, that working with Coach Dixon, um, it's just an honor to be able to play with, uh, play under him. Um, just he's just be on you every day, looking for perfection out of you, um, or just getting the most out of you each and every day. And it's just it was just an honor being able to play with him. Um, just every practice, he just be on on you, and um, pretty much you just gotta be just be ready, just just be mentally ready for everything that. That's thrown thrown at you at in practice in games. You just got to be ready. He expects you to be ready each and every day. The uh, the stakes are a bit higher, of course, playing in in the Big Twelve than was it the A ten or Atlantic ten, whatever it's George yeah. Mason plays at. Yeah. Was it tough? Did you have more jitters? I guess your first game at TCU, or or more jitters your first game at uh, George Mason as a freshman? Definitely as a freshman, yeah. I felt like um, once I I was made the transfer and already played like. Uh, X amount of games at the college level. So I, I didn't really, wasn't really nervous as much as I was once I was a, once I was, yeah. when I was a freshman. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Walk me through the, uh, cause you had a unique situation. I think you guys got able to to play George Mason when you're at TCU. Uh-huh. You, know, you played your old buddies there. Walk me through yeah. the setup of your emotions and your thoughts leading up to that game. Was that one you had circled from day one when you, when you committed to TCU? I I didn't circle it, but once it came, it was just like like wow, like like not a lot of players get to play like their old school that they transfer from. So I just it was just an awesome opportunity to be able to play against your buddies. You know, you know they hit you up, uh, just talking stuff. Like it was just a little going a little back and forth action. So once it came, it was just like like wow, like I'm really about to play these guys, and I just had to really lock in and take that like like that friend side away and just be ready to just go out and and just beat your buddies really. Yeah, yeah. That's I think that's it's it's tough to do for some people. For me myself, I always tell this story where for a bit I got into boxing, was trained for some boxing matches and me and my buddy did it together and we were trained mm-hmm. side by side and everything and we got to a point in time where the coaches put up put us up against each other. We had to spar against each other and I had yeah. a real tough time turning that friend switch off and going to competitor mode where he, he had no problem not looking at me as a friend and looking at me as another boxer. And he just, yeah. it's, yeah. uh, it's one of the more interesting things when, you know, you spend three or four years with people and you guys are close buddies and friends and everything. And then just a split yeah. second, you got to forget all of that and go at it, you know, as yeah. a competitor. Yeah. That's definitely how it was. You gotta, you gotta be able to flip that switch and just, just, to put all the friends things aside and just go out and just compete. You had another unique situation um, going out back to play at Iowa State where your dad played. Mm-hmm. Walk yep, me yep. through that. Was that another thing where I know you didn't have George Mason circle necessarily? Did you have that one circled? Uh, I wouldn't say I had that one circled either, really. But once again, like once it came, like it was just like me and my dad would kind of like talk a little stuff, like yeah. Is a matter, so it was. It's just the awesome. It was just awesome opportunities for me. Um, but once again, just being able to hit that switch and just just go out and play my game, really. Yeah, yeah. Let's get, I guess, a little nitty gritty here into basketball and the mental side of it. If you're in the middle of a game and you know your shot's not there, we talked a bit about you know the ways that 
we can still contribute to a team. Athletes can still contribute on defense, rebounding, yeah. hustle, whatever it may be. But I also feel like as a basketball player, if you miss your first couple of shots, you don't want to take stop taking shots the rest of the game. You still want to yeah. throw them up, right? What mm. do you do internally in your mind so that you're not hesitating on your next shot if you missed a couple beforehand? Like, what are you telling yourself? What's that script? Uh, pretty much is is all is multiple ways of scoring. So if I feel like my shot's not going, I'm gonna go in, go get a rebound, try to get a putback or get an easy layup first. To get my just get my rhythm, my timing going, um, or just doing something else like uh, on the defensive end, just making a great hustle play and just encouraging myself throughout the entire time that I'm just out there, just with any little thing that I'm doing, whether it is getting a key rebound, a, a steal, or getting a putback layup, or a drive to the hole, or something like that, just to get me going. So once I feel like I, I did something positive, then it just snowballs, like, pretty much. And maybe maybe that next shot will go in. And if it don't, then just making sure I stay confident and locked into my next, my skill set that I can go back and make that that fourth or fifth shot. So, yeah. It's almost like you're taking baby steps to get back to the point where you want to go. Like if your first couple of shots yeah. aren't there, like let's start at square one, right? Let's do an easy layup mm-hmm. or look for the easy points to get. Because so yeah. much, whether it's basketball or sports and life in general, I think people, they have a goal in mind and they try to jump from, you know, point A to point F, forgetting points B, C, D, and E. Like they try to take the, mm-hmm. the shortcut route. And yeah. I feel like that compares a lot to what you just described there, where if your shot's not there, don't just keep trying to do it over and over again. Try and get back into momentum, do those little things right, and then yeah. carry that momentum into taking another three or another contested shot. Yeah, 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 well, exactly. Tell me a bit about, that's a bit about, I guess, you know, in the middle of a game, how you reset your mind, but walk me through your process at the end of a, a game you guys lost, or you feel like you performed badly. How do you get over that? Cause it's gotta be, you know, the cliche of athletes. They, they don't really, you know, get over losses that easily, I guess. So how do you mm-hmm. bounce back from a tough loss and approach the next game with the same competitive spirit? Uh, I mean, tough losses is, is going to happen yeah. in the sport. So, I mean, pretty much you just got to pretty much have amnesia and just pretty much forget <laughs> about it and get ready for the next game. Like, yeah. it's, it's you can't really harp over tough losses. Like, you can be you be sad right after the game, but that next day you got to bounce back and get ready for the next one because the game's coming coming back to back, like, just like that. Yeah. Like, especially yeah. in the, uh, the uh, Big 12, I'm – they, the games are coming back to back. You got tough opponents each and every night. So yeah. you just got to be ready for it. Especially when you get to the conference tourneys, those, those games aren't yeah. spread out, you know, one a week or two a week. You're playing them every other day almost. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Is there Definitely. one game in particular that, that really stung to you that you lost that, you know, you feel like you being able to get over it really helped you mentally and being able to prepare for other losses that, that came up ahead? Yeah, it was, I would say, um, one tough, really tough loss that we had. It, like, the whole team just played poorly. Like, yeah. um, it was a, against Texas Tech at Tech, and yeah. it was it was just a terrible game for yeah. us. And just the vibe, like, on the bench, it was just awful. And pretty much I felt like that game, it kind of helped, it helped us, uh, like, actually to come back and just and bring that energy and bring that positivity each and every day. And it showed us that we need that every day in order to come out and be able to compete with these, these teams. And we can't come out just expecting teams to just roll over and give us the win. Like we just gotta, we gotta come out and actually take it and be ready to play. Yeah. Being a senior on that TCU team, I mean, you know, seniors by default are the leaders of the team, I think, because you have the most experience and the most knowledge to pass on. But you are in a unique situation where this was the first year on your team. So you're a senior, but also the first year kind of guy in the team. So there's kind of two sides to the coin there. Walk me through how you, you know, wrestled with that. Because on one hand, you want to be the senior and, and lead the players on the team. But I don't know if you had any feelings of not wanting to overstep other people's boundaries and kind of taking over the team. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, So pretty much I would say I'm a type of person that will lead by example uh, more say, but if I need to speak up, I will, but I just try to show it through my actions, through just playing hard each and every day. Um, Just showing, like showing the younger guys what, what it takes to, 
be able to play at the at the level, at the top level, and in college, really just being able to come in and just play hard each and every day, being able to just be consistent with your game. Mm-hmm. Is um were there anybody anyone growing up besides your dad, any maybe pros mm-hmm. that, that you looked up to and that you really try to model the mental side of the game after? Oh yeah, most definitely. It's a, a lot of pretty much a lot of the Flint guys like yeah. that's around here. Uh be my dad, of course, uh yeah. but Mateen Cleese, Morris Peterson, um who else? Uh la, la, I can't Kevin Tolbert, uh guy that went to uh, Michigan State. Yeah. Uh, my best friend, actually, Miles Bridges, uh, uh, I talk to him daily. Yeah. Um, it's just a, a lot of guys. I grew up around a lot of, like, basketball mind, basketball heads. Uh, just uh, the city of Flint just has a lot of professional, a lot of great basketball players around here. Mm-hmm. So I just grew up pretty much around basketball, yeah. like, by default. In your blood since day one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we talked a bit about, you know, the tough, lo- a tough loss that you had, but let's look at things in a more positive aspect. Is there a game that sticks out where you really look at it and think that the mental side of, of basketball and, and the mental side of who you are as a basketball player really helped you excel in that game and get over something maybe that happened early on? Uh, yeah, I will. Let me see. Uh, one specific game. I will probably say... I would say I would say the second time we played Baylor, mm. um, because the first time we played them, we lost, and they were, uh, like of course they were the number ranked team, one yeah. ranked team at the time, and like pretty much nobody had the like had confidence in us that we were going to win the second time. Like they were all like, "Oh, it's Baylor, like they're ranked, ranked team mm. stuff." I mean, but pretty much we just came out and just played like gave it our all we just all jailed as one played together and we all had confidence in one another and came out and got the victory really um we didn't harp on like go or uh, feed into the hype of that they're the best better team and this and that like just feeding into the media we just came out and played our game and our like once we did that we just showed everybody how how good tcu could actually be that's got to be a crazy experience playing a number one ranked team in the country. I mean, not everybody gets to, has the yeah. opportunity to do that. And just yeah. the whole overall vibe and, and just pre-match jitters that some people may feel, I think it's really testament to the mentality of the team you guys had and, and the coaching staff and the leaders on your team to be able to rally together and be, you know, what was considered at one point in time, the best team in the country. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Well, Listen, yeah. man. Um, another thing that I always kind of like to get a sense of is, how athletes judge how they performed in a game. Because what I find with a lot of kids is they're more outcome focused. So mm-hmm. when they look back at the game, they only care about the stats, right? Yeah. But they don't really care about the process to get there. So like doing mm-hmm. the little things right. So I always have the analogy yeah. of, um, you know, the good process may lead to the bad outcome sometimes, but majority mm-hmm. of the time, the good process leads to the good outcome. Uh, yeah. On the other hand, the bad process sometimes leads to a good outcome, but on the majority of the time, the bad process leads to a bad outcome. So I always stress with kids, focus on the process um, mm-hmm. of things and not on the outcome. So yeah. walk me through a bit, I guess, if you have any kind of thoughts on that, I guess, of, of just being more process versus outcome focused. Um, could be in the context mm-hmm. of a basketball game, could be in the context of setting goals with everyday life. Yeah. Um, so pretty much if I look, Look, say I look back at a game and um, at the end of the game, I'm trying to evaluate how I play. I will look at more so uh, the defensive side first Mm -hmm. of how I played and how did I contribute to um, what making the extra play, making hustle plays, stopping my man from scoring, Mm -hmm. um, being there for different rotations and things like that. Then I look on the look at the offensive side. Um, of being able to contribute to the team, making the right pass, making the right shot, not forcing forcing things, not um, just being there for rebounds, crashing, making sure I'm giving energy. Um, so pretty much I'm looking at, like, all the little things that I'm doing in order to to get the, like, the get the bigger picture of us winning or me contributing 
offensively getting getting points and putting myself in positions to score uh things of that nature so uh like you were saying just making sure that I do the little things to get the bigger the bigger outcome so um that like I said like just putting myself in different positions to be able to get that done I always use when I talk with kids, I always use like a video game analogy with them playing 2K. Like, if you have a wide open three in 2K and it's got a green release, right? But it might not go yeah. in just because yeah. the outcome was bad doesn't mean the process was bad. The process was good there. So yeah. keep doing that process. Whereas you can take, you know, how many shots where it's a red release, right? And, and yeah. it ends up going in. That's a bad process. Even though it was a good outcome, you don't want to repeat that bad process. That's yeah. the analogy I like yeah. to use with kids to understand like being process versus outcome focused. and where to really, you know, focus your attention as, as an athlete. Yeah, most definitely. Most definitely. What's your plan right now, man? Um, obviously you, you graduated from, or you, you finished at TCU your fifth year there. Yeah. Fifth year in basketball, first year there. Is the, uh, is the plan now to go pro overseas? Is it to, to tough it out here in, in, uh, in the U S what's, what's the plan right now? Yeah. The plan is that, uh, to try to tough it out here in the U S um, yeah. Uh, I feel like I just got, got an agent not too long ago. Um, so, yeah, I'm trying to stay here and try to see how I go here Yeah, for the most part. Yep. We, uh, I mean, going overseas would be such a, such a life change for anybody, right? That huge of a travel. Yeah. You went through a lot of travel yourself. I mean, being from, yeah. from Michigan and going to, to George Mason or to TCU or going around the country, you spent a lot of time mm-hmm. away from family. How hard yeah. was that for you maybe at the beginning? And is that something that, that got a bit easier as the years went by, or is it still something that you still get homesick every year? Um, I wouldn't say I pretty much got homesick. Um, cause I one I I went to um IMG Academy, it's down in Florida. Yeah. And um that's I showed signs of being homesick when I was there, but then I like eventually got over it and like I kinda got used to it to being out on my own really. Mm-hmm. And that's like so moving from Air lo- from different locations. It really wasn't a big, big issue for me. The IMG Academy is is so huge. like it's you see so many elite athletes go there and, and everything. Yeah. How did you end up there? Was did you get invited there? Did you go seek them out? How did that all come? About? Um, I got recruited to go there actually from um it was at a AU game in Vegas. Okay. Uh, it was a uh, coach Mahoney came and saw me and they offered me a scholarship to come uh come down there and play for. Them. Yeah. So you were playing AAU ball down there in Vegas already from a kid from Michigan. That's uh, it's a lot of pressure yeah. for a young kid. I always, I'm always yeah. amazed at, you know, as the years go by, there's more and more media hype on the younger kids as they grow up. And I always mm-hmm. just, I give them a lot of props because it's not easy being a young kid, you know, in the spotlight of everything, S- social media, fans, mm-hmm. the, the actual media and being able to, to go up there and play your, your game. I always have the example of yeah. the Ball Brothers and, and LaMelo Ball or this kid's got, you know, four or five million followers on Instagram, whatever it is. And he's still out there hooping every day and playing this game. I think it's really, it's really, I mean, underappreciated, I think, by the media and by everybody of how much pressure young kids go under as elite basketball players or elite football players and dealing with it and still living their life. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Most definitely. Listen, man, um, before we wrap up here, I got a couple rapid fire questions here. Being we're in quarantine and everything, what's one show you're binge watching at the moment? One show right now, I have not been watching a lot of TV, but actually, I have been started the 100. Okay, on I haven't heard that. I haven't heard of that one yet. But what's it about? Um, pretty much, it's a um, nuclear apocalypse that happened um, on Earth, and like, yeah. there's some survivors that staying in space, and they dropped a uh, hundred people down to the Earth, like, uh, what is it, like, ninety seven years later, yeah. to see if it's like to be able to come and live on Earth, yeah, uh, if they can come live on Earth again. And, yeah, I'm some, pretty much that far. So got far. some Stranger Things vibes to it, then. Yeah. <laughs> What are some art? What are some artists you're rocking with right now? Artists, I I listen to pretty much everyone, really. But um, right now, I would say what Lil Baby, um, um, uh, G Herbo, yeah. Um, what? Of course, J Cole. Um, I still listen to Kendrick Lamar. Yeah. Um, I I listen to everyone really. 
everyone. Yeah. J. Cole's uh J. Cole's what I'm rolling with right now. I went to go see him in Toronto last year, probably the best concert I've been to. It was oh yeah. What a show. He, he was there with um I think Jane Smith opened for him and Young Thug opened for him too. It was yeah. it was an amazing show, man. Yeah, I bet I need to go to one of those concerts. Yeah. Who's uh who's the toughest guy you've been matched up against at college ball, whether it was at George Mason or at TCU? Toughest guy. I would say the toughest matchup one. It was my freshman year, and I had to. It was against the senior named a uh, kid named Jack Gibbs. He went to Davidson, and he he was a uh, he was he was giving me some buckets. <laughs> I don't know why. He was giving me some buckets. What what was it? What was his game that really stood out to you the most? That was tough to deal with. It was just his release. His shot was just so quick. His just release. He just. At the time, just knew more about basketball than me. It just he just knew how to get to his spots and how to get his shot off. At, like it was just it was he was kind of lighting me up there. Was, that's one person I would say that really like just gave me some buckets. How 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 tough mentally was that to deal with in the middle of a game? Like what were you thinking? Were you just thinking, you know, I got no chance today. Let's just pack it in, or? Or how did how did you deal with that? No, nah, just pretty much taking it play by play, just making yeah. sure like, all right, he's not gonna score this time. Like, all right, he scored that time. All right, this time I'm gonna lock him up. Like, yeah. you can't never really just get down on yourself. That's how it's really, I feel like that's how it's gonna get worse. Like, you yeah. just uh, like, I can't stop this guy. Then pretty much I feel yeah. like yeah. like the offensive player just feeds off of that and just just goes to work. So I think pretty, too, what's what's important in situations like that is you know, he has everything to lose in a sense, right? And you have everything to gain, right? Because he's like the senior alpha dog guy and you're just a, a freshman, right? And yeah. it only takes you one play to make a difference in the game. Like you you stop him once, you block him once, that, mm-hmm. that could change the whole momentum of the game, right? So I think for a yeah. lot of people in the middle of a game, if they're feeling helpless, like the guy they're up against is just outmatching them in every aspect, like don't give up because it just takes one play for you to make to change the yeah. whole momentum of the game, right? That huge momentum swing. Yeah. 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 What's the uh, toughest place you had to play in as a college athlete? Mm. Toughest place? Uh, I, I would have to say probably Kansas. Yeah. Kansas was, that was the loudest gym I had stepped foot in. Like it was so packed in there. It was not one seat like available. And that that was a crazy game. That when did the uh, did, did, did any did you have any jitters for that game? Did anything did anything stick out pregame running into that? Like, did you have a this is Kansas moment where you, it kind of clicked where you were? Um, yeah, but then again, like I just pretty like I just pretty much just tuned it to myself. Really, yeah. like I, I'm a type of person like uh, I try to block out like all the hype and like all the media attention to it. And I just try to just tune into myself. So, like, I probably like say if I was to step in there as a freshman, yeah, I I'd, I'd probably definitely keep <laughs> be a lot different situation. But, but now that I'm like older, just pretty much just tune into myself is pretty much. I didn't really like get into it to the hype, but yeah. once I saw like this, the fans and stuff, I was like, wow, like, it's really not a seat available. And no. it was just it was just crazy. That's gonna be one of the. Uh the pinnacle arenas to play in as a college basketball athlete to go there to, yeah. to Lawrence, Kansas and, yep. and play against the Jayhawks. I mean, if I was there, I probably wouldn't even be able to step off the bus. I'd be so nervous. So I give you props <laughs> for going out there and balling out against them. <laughs> <laughs> Last question, man. Who's, who's one player who you think would be good on this podcast who has a strong mental game that you've played with or you know that, that really kind of you look up to and, and really admire the mental approach to the game? I would definitely say uh, Desmond Bain. Yeah. Um, he's one person that he, he would definitely give you a lot of a lot of feedback off of. Um, yeah. Just his mental approach is just just um, just amazing. I, I like um, like pretty much we're both grow like I'm older than him, but like just I just I kind of look up to him like mm-hmm. in a sense where he's just like uh, he's a pro. Like I give it to him, he's a pro. Anything, anything that really sticks out to you, like maybe the number one mental lesson you got from him that you really felt makes a difference in maybe not only just your game but your day to day life. Um, just pretty much his approach yeah. uh, to the game and just to everything. Really, he just has a 
a unique approach to everything of uh, just trying to be the best at at everything he does really and it's just it's pretty much similar to like how I look at things yeah. as well yeah, so, yeah. on that yeah. note i um i I always am amazed at you know how much crossover there is between sports and personal life for me myself, I look back at when I was a kid and I wasn't you know maybe I was a bit more shy than others. And there's a lot of things in sports I didn't try because I was shy in my personal life. Whereas I look back at it now and maybe I'm not so shy. I'm a bit more confident. I look back and there's some things I would have changed. It's just really interesting to me that the crossover between personal life and, and sports where usually the, the personality you have off the court is usually what dictates your game on the court. Like if you're a bit more yeah. confident, you might be taking a bit more of those shots, right? How, yeah. has, how has for you personally, last question here, how has basketball... Um, influence your personal life? Some of the mental lessons you've learned as a basketball player, how have they translated and felt have made you a better person overall? Um, Pretty much I've been getting talked to once again by my dad about how yeah. like the um, like the basketball side or uh, crossover to to how you are off on and off the court. Um, so like if you're like, he would always tell me, like, if you're lazy on the court, you're lazy in, like, in your personal life. If you're mm-hmm. a hard worker on the court, you're going to be hard and hard working on, like, um, off the court. So pretty much just bringing that approach of just giving giving my all in whatever it is that I'm doing, whether that's what taking care of family members, whether that's doing, like, a job of somewhere, like, off the court somewhere, yeah. just just making sure I just give him my all, and just yeah. He, he's just been teaching me that ever since I was young. So that's I why I think I think for athletes, even if, if even if they don't even if they don't have the uh, the aspiration of going pro, I think it's so important for for everyone to play sports at some point in their life because it teaches you those lessons like working hard, discipline, problem solving, like getting along as a team. It teaches you all those life lessons that you might not be exposed to in, in other situations. So I, I always say, you know, even if you don't have plans to go to the NBA or the you know NFL or or whatever it is. There's a lot of life lessons you can learn in sport that to develop you as a person. That's the beautiful thing of sport that, that you see people grow over time, right? Yeah, most definitely. Listen, man, I appreciate you taking some time today. Uh, again, wish that, that you, your friends, and your family stay safe during this time. And hopefully everything's wrapped up soon and we can see everyone back on the court. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, I just hope everything's going well with you and your family as well. And I appreciate you taking time out with me as well. Appreciate it, man. Take care, man. All right. Okay, you too.